The common people of ancient Rome, like the common people of so many societies, had scant opportunity to leave a written record of their grievances and aspirations. What little we know of them suggests that the proletariat could sometimes display a social consciousness superior to anything possessed by their would-be superiors. Many of them worked next to slaves and were themselves freedmen or sons of freedmen, being almost as poor as slaves. In 63, during Cicero's witch hunt, several dissenting leaders urged workmen and slaves to take action against the oligarchs. Such appeals wouldn't have made sense unless there was some kind of community interest between plebs and slaves. In parts of Sicily, the agrarian proletariat joined in common cause with slaves to rebel against big planters on several occasions, including Spartacus's great rebellion. Not all of Spartacus's men were slaves. A lot of them were freedmen, poor, but they were so desperately poor, they sided with the slaves in common interest. And so, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we face this largely one-sided recording of what is called history. Cicero, Brutus, and Cato come down to us as the defenders of liberty, when they were something quite contrary, and Caesar, who did something for the poor and moved against privileged property, who did something for economic democracy, comes down to us as an elitist tyrant. What we have here is the confusion of procedural democracy and substantive democracy. Remember, democracy must be something more than its procedure and its form. It must also have a democratic output. Otherwise, it's very little more than just a legitimating cloak for class tyranny. And that was the heart of the matter with the Roman Republic and the danger with every capitalist republic of today. And those who fought for economic democracy because they faced a rigged system often might violate republican procedure and are immediately labeled as tyrants and power-hungry people. This was true of Caesar, Robespierre, Lenin, Huey Long, Fidel Castro, the Sandinistas. We heard it again and again. When were those Sandinistas going to have freedom in Nicaragua or Castro rights in Cuba or wherever? No such question was raised when these countries were ruled by right-wing dictatorships that opened themselves to global investments and profit accumulation. The tyranny of the Sandinistas was that they were actually making changes in the economic system and class structure of Nicaragua. So we must read against the grain when we read mainstream history, and we must swim against the mainstream. And we must try to keep connected to those who came before us. Certainly not the Ciceros and the Catos, as we're urged and trained to do, nor even the Gracchi or Caesar or the Populares leaders, but rather we must try to stay linked to the anonymous masses upon whose shoulders they stood, the common people who struggled against all odds with all the courage and fear and all the inconsistencies of ordinary people who put themselves on the line, whose names we will never know, whose blood and tears we will never see, whose words and cries of pain we will never hear, and yet to whom we are linked in a past that is never dead and never really past, and a future that never arrives but keeps beckoning us and keeps us going. So history never ends, the last page is never written, and the best pages are written not by princes, and presidents and prime ministers and popes, and not even by professors, but by the people. For all their faults and shortcomings, the people are all we have. In fact, we are they. Thank you very much.